So our next speaker is um, Maureen Hansen, and she's talking about cellular uh, metabolism of immune cells. Is that her topic? This is the group in my lab that works on MECFS. Uh, all of them are here except for one. And um, the, uh, uh, this work that uh, you're going to hear about was funded not by our Collaborative Research Center grant, but actually by an earlier NIH R21 uh, uh, grant that we had. It was also funded by uh, Cimarron Research, and we collaborated with Dan Peterson's group. Uh, his group is also here. And um, the, uh, yesterday, uh, one, of, one of my lab members, Alex Mandarano, gave a talk at the Young Investigators meeting in which she described uh, a project that is a collaborative research project with the Columbia Center and uh, with the Jackson Lab Center. And uh, not, this is not the project that's going to be uh, given today. But um, uh, Alex's work uh, on this project uh, that's the subject of this uh, talk uh, was actually also funded by a private donor who I hope is listening who gave Alex the uh, gift of time and that she was able to work full time on this project as a result of this private funding. And since Alex is here, after having uh, been uh, speaking at the uh, Young Investigators meeting, I decided it was inappropriate for me to give the talk. And I'm going to actually invite Alex to give the talk that she put together. And uh, she will describe the, uh, the work that she's been doing on this topic. Okay, <laughs> so as we've been hearing throughout this session is that I think all of you are well aware, there's been a lot of research to try to understand how the immune system plays a role in MECFS. And we have a lot of evidence to suggest that the immune system is dysfunctional in this disease. But there's also been a lot of research lately and a lot of interest in how metabolism plays a role in MECFS especially with metabolomic studies, which have shown us that there are many metabolites that are differentially abundant between patients and healthy controls. And what I'm really interested in for my work is the interface of these two areas of research, which is known as immunometabolism. So immunometabolism is based on the idea that immune cells, like any other cell in the body, rely on metabolism for their function. But immune cells also rely on the nutrients that are available to them, receptor signaling, oxygen availability, and cytokine signaling to drive that metabolism. And what's unique about immune cells is that they have to cope with all these different environments in the body, like hypoxic inflamed tissue or a tumor microenvironment, and then adjust their metabolism accordingly. And in addition, when immune cells are activated and they have to proliferate, they have to increase specific metabolic pathways to drive that proliferation and then to um, allow them to have these specialized functions when they differentiate into effector cells. So before I get into what this looks like in specific immune cells, I just wanted to highlight a couple of the key pathways that I'm going to be talking about in our work. So the first energy pathway that we're interested in is glycolysis. It occurs in the cytoplasm. It uses glucose, and it doesn't require oxygen to function. And the final product of glycolysis is pyruvate. And pyruvate can then be used in the mitochondria to drive mitochondrial respiration. And so the second pathway that we're interested in is oxidative phosphorylation in the mitochondria, or mitochondrial respiration, which does require oxygen, and it produces ATP much more efficiently than glycolysis. So in T cells, which are really the best studied example of immune cell metabolism, at rest, the T cell is mainly using oxidative phosphorylation to produce ATP, which is, of course, the most efficient way to do that. And the T cell is also doing very little synthetic metabolism at this point. But when the cell is activated, it increases both mitochondrial respiration and glycolysis to a large extent, but it becomes more dependent on glycolysis to produce ATP, even though that's less efficient. And it's thought that that is so that intermediates from things like the citric acid cycle can be shunted into other synthetic pathways in the cell to build biomass and to drive these new specialized functions. So you see an increase in synthetic metabolism, 
and also in transporters that bring in substrates for these pathways, like GLUT1, which brings in glucose to drive the increase in glycolysis. So you can imagine that because this is so critical to immune cell function, that it's very highly regulated, and that if something goes wrong in metabolism or in its regulation, that it can contribute to human disease states. So this is a very simplified diagram of different metabolic states in T cells and how they can contribute to different disease states. So for example, if you have high metabolism or a hypermetabolic state in a T cell, it can contribute to autoimmunity where the immune cells are overly active or active when they should not be. But on the other end of the spectrum, when you have hypometabolism or low metabolism in the cells, they are functioning at a lower level and they're less able to respond. And this can contribute to cancer or a chronic infection where the immune system is less able to control that infection or target and clear tumor cells. So we do have some evidence of immune metabolism in ME-CFS now. So for example, that oxidative phosphorylation may be defective in neutrophils. There was a report that there was increased non-mitochondrial ATP production and Christi condensation in mitochondria from patient PBMCs. And then there are a couple of nice papers from Kara Thomas, which showed reductions in mitochondrial respiration in PBMCs from patients. But she's recently followed up on that and shown no difference in mitochondrial complex activity in PBMCs. And there's also a recent report of reduced glycolytic reserve in patient natural killer cells. So I've done a little work on this that Maureen has previously presented, looking at total T cells from patients from our microbiome study. And what we found was that in total T cells from 20 female patients versus 20 female controls, they were using less of their total mitochondrial respiratory capacity. So they didn't have a different capacity for mitochondrial respiration, but they were using less of it. But we still have a lot of questions as far as how metabolism is affected within specific patient immune cells. And we also had another concern about this data, and that is that there is a lot of variability in the percentage of different immune cells in humans. And so uh, Daria just did a great job of talking about the different T cell subsets, but I'm going to focus again on CD8 positive T cells versus CD4 positive T cells. And if you look at healthy human subjects, over age and by sex, you see a great amount of variability in the percentage of CD8 or CD4 T cells. And this is a really nice resource uh, that recently came out, 10,000 Immunomes, that has put together a lot of different data from healthy subjects. So we were concerned that when we look at just total T cells, we're not taking into account the percentage of these subsets, and we really wanted to get into at least CD8 versus CD4 positive T cells. So to do all of these things, we needed a new study population. So in October of 2017, I went out to Incline Village to start collecting a new study population with Cimarron. Um, and they have been a great help in collecting these samples and sending them to us since then. So we've actually recently just finished this up. And we have 45 healthy control samples and 54 patient samples. We were really excited to have a fair amount of males in this study population. And you can see that the ages are well matched between the two groups. So the overall design of this study was to start with PBMCs. We're isolating CD8 positive T cells, CD4 positive T cells, CD19 positive B cells, and CD56 positive NK cells. We're studying metabolism both at rest and after the cells have been stimulated so that we can see how they can respond to an immune challenge and potentially reprogram their metabolism. And we do this in a few different ways. So we're using the Seahorse Extracellular Flux Analyzer to look at rates of metabolism in our cells. We use flow cytometry to look at markers related to metabolism and activation. And then we're using confocal microscopy to actually image the mitochondria in our cells. And all of this work since this last summer has been done with the help of another graduate student in the lab, Jessica Maya, who is here today. Um, and so she's been a huge help in doing these experiments because we have a lot of samples to run. So what I would like to do is first go a little more in depth into the methods that we use, and then I will explain our data from mitochondrial respiration and finally from glycolysis. And today, because of where we're at in the project and in the interest of time, I'm going to focus on our T-cell results. 
So our main method in the lab is the seahorse. And for this project, we used the 96-well seahorse machine. And we really needed the 96-well machine to run as many samples as we had, but we only had a machine at Cornell that could run eight-well plates instead of a 96-well plate. And so we've been really lucky to have the help of Paul Geyer's lab at Dartmouth Medical College. He invited us to come up and use the machine they have at Dartmouth. Um, so I made a trip last April, and Jessica and I went back this August to run a whole bunch of plates. Um, and we would not have been able to do this without their help. But luckily, in November, uh, Cornell did purchase a 96-well machine that's in our core facility now that we're able to use to finish this project. So the seahorse gives us rates of glycolysis and mitochondrial respiration in our cells simultaneously. And the way that this works is you seed your cells in a single layer in each well. And then there are these probes that are inserted at different time points. And each probe has two fluorophores that are excited at each time point. One is sensitive to pH, so it gives you a rate of glycolysis because glycolysis produces protons. The other quenches oxygen and gives you an oxygen consumption rate, which is your rate of mitochondrial respiration because complex four consumes oxygen. On top of that, the seahorse has four drug injection ports for each well, you can see here. And so you can inject up to four compounds sequentially into your cells to perturb different parts of metabolism, and this gives you even more information. So we mainly use two drug panels in the lab. The first is the mitostress test. So here we're interested in the oxygen consumption rate for mitochondrial respiration. And we first get a measurement of basal respiration. Then we inject oligomycin, which will inhibit ATP synthase. This gives us a rate of ATP production. Then we inject FCCP, which is an uncoupler. So it disrupts the proton gradient in the mitochondrial membrane. The cell compensates by increasing the electron transport chain, and we get a quote-unquote maximal respiration. From that, we can also calculate a spare respiratory capacity. And then finally, we inject rotenone and antimycin A to inhibit complexes one and three of the electron transport chain. And this gives us any non-mitochondrial respiration as well as any proton leak. The other assay that we use in the lab is the glycolytic rate assay. This is a newer and more quantitative way of looking at glycolysis on the seahorse. And the reason that it's more quantitative is because glycolysis produces protons, but so does the citric acid cycle. So seahorse has figured out a way to calculate the percentage of protons that are coming just from glycolysis and not from the citric acid cycle. And this gives you a glycolytic specific proton efflux rate. So we first get basal glycolysis. Then we inject rotenone and antimycin A, again, to inhibit mitochondrial respiration. The cell compensates by increasing glycolysis, so we get a compensatory glycolysis. And then we inject 2-DG, which is a glucose analog, to inhibit glycolysis, and this gives us any post-2-DG acidification. Okay, so as I said, we're also doing flow cytometry, and I won't go super in-depth on how this works, but to give you a very simplified description, you can stain your cells with antibodies that are conjugated to fluorophores, and you use antibodies for things on the surface you're interested in. But what we also do in the lab is actually use intracellular stains. So for example, we can stain mitochondria with fluorescent stains as well. And then you have these fluidics that will move the cells one at a time through a laser, which will excite your fluorophores. And then you have detectors for each color you're interested in that can quantify the fluorescence for each color. So you get a quantification of, let's say, red versus green in each single cell. And so some of the things that we're looking at are mitochondria with two different dyes, which I'll talk about more in a minute. We look at CD69, which is a marker of early activation in our cells. And we're also looking at GLUT1, which I mentioned is the main glucose transporter into the cell. So to go a little more in depth on how we look at mitochondria, we're using a pretty cool technique that's been used by a number of other labs where we stain the mitochondria with two different dyes. One is mitotracker green, which stains for mitochondrial mass. So it'll stain the mitochondria as long as the cells are alive. And the other is mitotracker red CMX ROS, which is actually sensitive to mitochondrial membrane potential. So when you treat the cells with something like FCCP, which is an uncoupler, you see a loss in that red staining, 
which indicates a loss of mitochondrial membrane potential and tells you that the mitochondria are less healthy. And you can quantify this with flow cytometry as well. So for example, in this paper that was looking at T cells after ED infection, they found a population of cells that had green but had lost red. So each of these single dots is a single cell. And you can also visualize these using confocal microscopy and see cells that have green but don't have red staining. And so we use both of these methods. Finally, as I said, we are activating our cells for these assays. So for both our CD4 and CD8 T cells, we are activating them overnight with anti-CD3, anti-CD28, and IL-2. And we did check this method on both the seahorse and with flow cytometry to see that we were properly activating the cells before we ran our experiments. So now getting into our data for mitochondrial respiration. When we look at CD8 T cells, we see no significant difference in basal mitochondrial respiration between controls and patients, either at rest or after the cells are activated. But what I want to point out in this data that's interesting is that we can see the control population increases its basal mitochondrial respiration to a small extent after activation. But the patient cells really don't increase their mitochondrial respiration after activation. And so this indicates that they may be less able to respond to the immune challenge and increase their metabolism. We did also look at the mitochondria. And so we see that there's no significant difference in mitotracker green staining between controls and patients either at rest or after activation. So there's no significant difference in mitochondrial mass. However, we do see a significant reduction in the mitotracker red CMX raw staining in our patients at rest and after activation, which indicates a loss of mitochondrial membrane potential. We also visualized the mitochondria with confocal. Oh, before I get to that, so you can also plot the flow cytometry data with dot plots. And so this is merged data from all our controls or all our patients. And what you see if you look at the red versus the green is that the patient cells fall a little lower compared to the controls. And so again, they have less red, but they still have the green staining. The same thing is true after activation in this population here. This group of control cells is actually just due to one control. So now looking at the confocal, what we see is that in the controls, both at rest and after they've been activated, the green and the red co-stain very nicely. So you can see green where there is red, and this merges nicely in the image. But in the patients, we find cells where there are areas of green that either have very little or no red. And this is also true after activation, so there's some green here, if you can see it, that doesn't stain red, and there's overall less red versus green. And so this is consistent with what we see in the flow cytometry data. So now looking at our CD4 T cell results, we again see no significant difference in basal mitochondrial respiration at rest between the controls and patients or after activation. But what's interesting about the CD4 T cells is that the patients seem able to increase mitochondrial respiration, unlike the CD8 T cells, although we do have a lot of variation in the activated mitochondrial respiration. And so along with that, there's no significant difference in either mitotracker green or mitotracker red staining in the CD4 T cells, indicating no difference in mitochondrial mass or membrane potential. And we did image these cells on the confocal as well, and we see really nice uh, co-staining of both mitotracker green and red in all of the cells. So to summarize what I've shown you for this part, we see a decrease in mitochondrial membrane potential in our CD8 T cells from patients. And we also see that they seem to be less able to increase mitochondrial respiration in response to activation. But we don't see any significant differences in the CD4 T cells as far as mitochondrial respiration is concerned. So now looking at glycolysis. We see that basal glycolysis is reduced at rest in CD8 T cells, but we don't see a significant difference after activation in the CD8 T cells. And we see a small increase in glycolysis in both controls and patients. And interestingly, there is no significant difference in compensatory glycolysis in the resting cells or in the activated cells. So this seems to be reserved just to resting cells and if you push them to increase their glycolysis, they can. 
We did also look at GLUT1 abundance on the cells, and we see that GLUT1 is increased after activation, both in controls and patients, as we would expect. But we don't see any significant differences between the groups. But what I wanted to point out is that if you zoom in on the resting GLUT1 abundance, there's a small non-significant decrease in GLUT1 on the patient cells versus the controls. And really, the difference that we see in the basal glycolysis rate on the seahorse is relatively small. And so I think this isn't necessarily inconsistent with the GLUT1 abundance. Next, looking at CD4 T cells, we also see a significant reduction in basal glycolysis in our patient cells at rest, although we don't see any difference in basal glycolysis after activation in those cells. Interestingly, in the CD4 T cells, there is a significant reduction in compensatory glycolysis at rest, but there's no difference after the cells have been activated. So again, the differences in glycolysis seem to be restricted to the resting cells. And again, we looked at GLUT1 abundance, and we see no significant differences between controls and patients. There was a lot of variation in our control population after activation, but this is not a significant difference between the control and patient group. So to summarize what I've now added on, we see a significant decrease in basal glycolysis at rest, both in our CD8 and CD4 T cells. And we also see a significant reduction in compensatory glycolysis at rest in the CD4 T cells. But to take this back to the big picture, if we look at our pyramid of metabolism and how it affects different disease states, everything that we see in MECFS is more on the side of hypometabolism. And so this would be consistent with some kind of infection in MECFS, but it doesn't tell us for sure that there is an infection or what would have caused the disease. But it does raise a lot of additional questions and experiments that I would love to run. Um, but we have some things that are in the pipeline coming up. So <laughs> I am going to look at cytokines in plasma from these same samples in collaboration with Ludovic Gilato, a postdoc in our lab. And it's his birthday today, by the way. Um, <laughs> and we do have a lot of other clinical data from these samples that we've gotten from Cimarron and from our surveys that we're just starting to look through and analyze along with this data, and I think that will really help our interpretation. As I said, we're also looking at BNNK cells, and we're moving along with that project as well, so hopefully you'll hear about that soon. And as Maureen mentioned, I'm also working on a collaborative project with the MECFS research centers to look at PBMC metabolism at rest and after stimulation, which I think will give us a lot more information on what's going on in the disease. And so with that, I'll just again thank everybody in my lab, especially Jessica um, and our collaborators at Dartmouth and Cimarron and our core facilities and sources of funding. And I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I saw at least a couple of your slides that you're, you had seemed to have more people in the resting group than in the. Yes, group. Yes. Yes. So what's that about? Do you think that you have enough power to say? Um, and the other question that goes hand in hand with that is that P. Oh, I can't hear you. The PBMC <laughs> study that you plan to do. Um, this one you're doing single cell population. Right. I'll repeat yeah, it. I'll repeat it back. <laughs> Try to grab one of those two questions. Okay, so she asked about how we have less cells in our activated population versus our resting populations. And that was just um, how many samples we had and how many cells we have. The seahorse requires a lot of cells for every assay. So by the time we get to activation, a lot of times we have limited cells to work with and we do the best that we can. But I would obviously love to have more samples if I could. <laughs> And your planned, um, your planned PBMC study, how does that differ than the one you're doing right now? So in the PBMC study, we'll just be working with total PBMCs, and they will be either at rest or stimulated with anti-CD3 and anti-CD28. Um, and it'll just give us another population to compare back and also to see if we get the same results as Kara Thomas's paper. Any other questions? Well, congratulations. You're our speaker of the day for staying on time. <laughs> well done. And uh, I want to thank everybody in this session.